All right, awesome. They really won't let you start until it hits zero. It's kind of annoying. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, this is detecting server-side request forgery events on AWS using Splunk. Uh, if you are not here for this, now's the time to exit. But please, stay. Uh, who am I? So for those of you who don't know me, I'm sure there are a few in the audience that have met me before, but my name is Tom Smith. I am almost eight years at Splunk as a security strategist. Uh, I have led, for those of you who are familiar with Boss of the SOC, our blue team exercise. I've led that the past two years for version six and version seven. And prior to that, I was also a content lead for three, four, and five. Uh, if anyone has ever played one of the versions with UBA, that was me. So um, if you're familiar with that, that was me. I am based north of Boston in York, Maine, which is really not that far from Maine, or uh, from Boston, it's only about an hour north. I've been 25 years in IT and security, and I've worked pretty much everywhere. I always make a joke that, yes, I too have worked at Semantic. Um, and I have a few certifications. So let's jump into it. We're gonna go through what exactly is server-side request forgery, how I went through recreating this, and uh, I'll, I'll touch on that in a second. Uh, what AWS specifically told us during this attack, um, how do we get AWS data and other data into Splunk, what did we see with Splunk that we didn't see with AWS? Very important. And what's next for all of you? So uh, very quickly, when I say the event, um, I mean an attack. Uh, AWS made me change that to event. But let's be real. This is uh, server-side request forgery is an attack against a machine. And that's what I'm here to talk about. Uh, anytime you see the word event, I may say event, but just swap that out with attack. Uh, how did this come about? So a couple years ago, uh, someone said to uh, the bots team, uh, and that person is actually sitting in the room, that someone, said, we need an AWS only event. And I kind of said, what do you mean only? Like just AWS telemetry, just what AWS is telling us. And he said, yes, just AWS, no extra data, nothing from machines or applications or anything, just what AWS provides. And this was three years, three years ago. So I got to work and created this event based on a specific attack, which we'll talk about in a second. And it was really telling what AWS provides you versus what you probably really want to see. And the whole goal of this presentation and this talk is really how the two work better together as opposed to separate. One thing, I am very, very interactive, so feel free to shout out questions as we go. If you have questions, uh, there will be enough time at the end for questions. There's also a mic at the center if you feel better on mic, but I will be able to hear you if you uh, shout out at me. So, what is a server-side request forgery? AWS, out of the box, by default, provides this really cool endpoint, 169.254.169.254. Everyone's familiar with that, right? Everyone knows about that? All the cool stuff that you can do with that? Does everybody know all the bad stuff that you can do with it? Well, we're about to talk about that. So what happened in this specific event, and the attack that I created is based on a real world event, and we'll get to that in a second. But what happened was someone interrogated a vulnerable website or a web application and was able to pass malicious code to that endpoint. Basically a curl command. So what it, what it did, what it allowed a, an attacker to do, an, or a, an adversary, was to query that endpoint at will. And it took me maybe about 15 minutes to set up a website to do this, and about 20 minutes to set up the AWS environment to do it. 
One of the things that I want to make very clear because I got into an argument about this with someone at uh, Reinforce, this is bare bones, vanilla, AWS, out of the box. I clicked on setup. I didn't configure anything, I didn't change anything. I just, as a new user would, set this up. Doesn't seem like that big of a deal though, right? Being able to interrogate that endpoint. You know what's there, it's metadata, it's information about what's going on in your environment. Well, this specific attack, and I'm coming over here to read my notes, gave us close to 100 million individual records affected or customers. It gave us end user customer data exfiltrated. Now this is a financial institution. I'm not naming the name of that financial institution, but I will say that if you happen to go Google, 2019 SSRF attack, you will be able to figure out who that financial institution is. What does a financial institution have about you? Think about everything that you give to a credit card company when you apply for a credit card company. Your name, your mother's maiden name. Address, credit score, telephone, birthday, social security number, all of that, right? Anything else? There, I'm sure there's other stuff. All of that for 100 million people was exfiltrated. That's why it's bad. When I say bad, right, air quotes. I think there's a dollar amount in my notes somewhere. No. 140,000 social security numbers and 80,000 linked bank account numbers in this specific attack. Chances are very good that if you live in the United States, you were part of this breach. We'll leave it at that. So, how did I recreate the attack? Um, a few things. I put this up here just because we love MITRE. Uh, if you're a Splunk customer, you know we love MITRE. Everything is MITRE. Uh, but this goes through the techniques and tactics that, that I specifically used to recreate this attack. Obviously, you went through discovery. You went through escalation, persistence, and data exfiltration. We're gonna take a look at each of these phases right now. So, for discovery, if you remember, I said, very simple command. And some of this is obfuscated because some of it is actually still out there. Uh, I did this in April of this year, too. So, I, I know I said three years ago I did this. I did it again in April and it still worked. So nothing has been fixed in three years or remediated. You can see that the page I hit was the contact us PHP page. And I just did a simple redirect to that endpoint and asked for the latest security credentials of the endpoint that was running. That's all. And I got back this blob of text. Now everyone knows what you can do with that blob of text, right? Anyone not know? I'm sorry, I feel like I'm ignoring you guys over here, but I'm not. Any questions so far on, on this part of it? Okay. So now I have some ability inside of this AWS account. What's the next thing that I do? I wanna escalate, right? I created a simple Lambda function, very, very simple, um, in Python, and you can see it there, what it does, and it allowed me to create that function inside of their account. So now I have a Lambda function that when run is going to give me the same information I think that I just got, but how many people here run Lambda as an administrator? This company did. He's shaking his head no. This company did. Uh, so guess what I got back? Full admin privileges to their AWS account. All of this took five minutes. 
So after that, I have a file that was created from the Lambda function on my local machine, which is really cool, that has access key, secret access key, and session token. Again, everyone here knows what you can do with that, right? So what's after escalation in the chain of attack? Persistence. Now that I have admin, I can create a new user, which I did. And because I'm an admin, I can assign that user any role, which I did. You can see down at the bottom, I assigned that user admin access. So now, even if something changes with the credentials that I had, I have full admin access to their AWS environment on my own. All within about 15 minutes. Any, any thoughts on what, I love this question, and please feel free to shout out, I have no problems with that. Any thoughts on what AWS might have told me about this sequence of events so far? What's that? No one's gonna do it? Oh, okay, all right. So this is an anomaly. Anything else? <laughs> That's a good one, we'll get there. Up to when I created the user account, AWS logged nothing. Well, that, let, let me rephrase that. AWS logged nothing from a security perspective that I would be looking at as a security person. So what did I do? Because I'm a mischiev mischievous guy, I unblocked all of their S3 buckets. And I spun up, this was a POC, this was a test environment. I tried to spin up 25 GPU machines to farm Ethereum. Remember, this was three years ago, right? Um, everyone knows that AWS blocks you from spinning up GPU machines unless you send an email to them to, to request. He's shaking his head, I had no idea. So I got an error. So I just did a T2 micro. But this explain, you know, this kind of shows you what I could have done if I had the persistence and consistency that I wanted. These are the only tools that I used. That's it. Digital Ocean is the only thing on this list that costs money. And it cost me $13 for a month. And I didn't even have to do that. We did it because our fake adversary likes to hang out in the Netherlands. That's... So this is to your point. Everyone's seen this, right? The AWS shared responsibility model. You know what you're responsible for? Everything in blue. If you think about how I broke into that environment, what I did, it didn't touch anything in yellow. Everything that I utilized was blue. Customer application, operating system, client-side data. AWS never had any idea what I was doing. Oop, wrong button. So that at the top is just another same thing, different view, right? Same thing that we just looked at, different view. What's important here is you see at the top what I'm trying to suggest with this conversation, and it's just a conversation. This is not a sales pitch. What I'm trying to suggest that Splunk can maintain that part that you're responsible for, or help you maintain that part that you're responsible for, while well, AWS does all the other stuff down at the bottom. So what did AWS tell us? So Security Hub threw an event that said credentials were created. So when I created the new user, Security Hub notified me, which is good, right? And you're gonna see Splunk screenshots. I'm sorry, I'm a Splunk employee. That's just what it is. But you can see everything within the event when that user was created. 
token, username. You can't see it, it's obfuscated, but it, it's there. What did guard duty tell us? Well, guard duty was kind enough to tell us that a whole bunch of S3 buckets was unblocked. But it didn't tell us how, why, who. What did CloudTrail say? Well, now if you know what you're looking for, CloudTrail actually has the answer. But would you know to look for these specific actions in order? Does anyone know what get caller identity does? What is the equivalent of get caller identity in the rest of the world? You're shaking your head. Yep, I heard it. Who am I? What's that? Who am I? Right? Because, I mean, when I break into something, I want to know who I am, so I run, who am I? So what didn't say anything? And, and this, is, this is the interesting part. CloudWatch didn't say anything. VPC flow logs. This is where I got into an argument at Reinforce. Didn't say anything. S3 access logs didn't say anything, but you know what happens when you turn on public access to an S3 bucket, right? Config, inspector, those wouldn't say anything anyways, but that's what I had turned on. So we're gonna stop there for the AWS portion. Any questions so far on the event or attack and what occurred? All right, now, oh, you have a question, sorry. Correct, correct. Like I said at the beginning, this is vanilla install, I clicked all the defaults, I didn't configure anything. That's okay, that's all right. Thank you for coming. So one of the things that has historically, let me see a show of hands. If you don't want to raise your hand, it's completely fine, but we're all anonymous here, kind of. How many Splunk, or Splunk customers do we have? I know Splunk employees, we have two. So we're, we're good. How many people have tried to onboard AWS data into Splunk and failed miserably? Yeah, okay. So GDI, or getting data in for Splunk, and AWS has always been super difficult. Um, it seems like every time AWS introduces a new service, we have a different way that you have to bring data in. Does that sound familiar? Um, too many different types of data, too many different versions of that data, and what I mean by that is, why does guard duty come in by itself and come in through Security Hub? I don't know, but it does. Right, like doesn't make sense. Data changes without notice, so I'm old, or um, some of you are older. Everyone remembers when Windows decided to change event codes from three digits to four digits and pretty much broke every security vendor software out there. AWS loves to do that. So we introduced something called Data Manager. And this is really the only pitch in my entire, in, entire talk, and it's not really a pitch. But we introduced something called Data Manager, Splunk Cloud Data Manager, with a couple checks, clicks of a button, and typing in your AWS accounts, it will go out and reach and start to bring in that data. So much easier than editing comp files and configuring pages and pages of regions and things like that. You check, you know, you check what you want, click go, and it does it. Has anyone used this? He's raising it. You, you seem really happy about that. Awesome. So much easier? <laughs> well, 
We should get a quote from him. What do you think after the, after the show? What's that? <laughs> So now, how does data flow from AWS to Splunk? So you've got all the things, right? I'm not going to talk about specific services or specific logs. You have all of the AWS things coming in through our HTTP event collector now. In hitting, Kinesis ultimately going to ES. Now, if you happen to also have Phantom Soar, we can send that down too. So you can see phantom slash soar at the bottom. Uh, we'll talk about that in a second, how you can automate some of the stuff that I did. This is probably what more of you are familiar with. We do have GDI or getting data in for non-AWS type of logs. And I just threw up the three that I used, Apache, stream, and then a, a, just a empty screenshot of how to add, you know, you type in Azure there and it will bring up Azure things. You type in Google there, it will bring up Google things. Last sales slide, I promise. Um, so this just kind of runs everything into our ecosystem, right? You see all of the AWS data sources at the bottom coming into Splunk, whether it's Splunk Enterprise Core or Cloud, it's the same software. And then you have ES, which is our SIM. You have Behavior Analytics, which is our machine learning algorithms. And then you have Phantom or SOAR, which is our SOAR platform. Any questions on this? All right, funny story about the next slide. <clears throat> so have you noticed over the past year or so, as you attend trade shows, there have been less memes? Less and less memes, like not any memes and slides anymore? If you go Google, oh my God, Splunk, this is a picture that's up on Google. I had this in my original deck, and they told me I had to remove it. So guess what I did? I took one of my Splunk shirts, I put it on a table, I took a picture, I photoshopped oh my god, Goog or, oh my god Splunk on it, and I put it in. And I said, okay, exact same picture, I created this one, it's not, it's not a meme, just please don't come after me. So what did we see once we added some other interesting information? Do you remember this screenshot that I just showed? And I tore some stuff out for importance. So just through the talk, we know that the first event is that user create that guard duty saw at 12.35 p.m. I know the slide says AM, I'm sorry, but 12.35 PM. What happens if we add some stream and web data to our investigation? So I can see that the original interrogation of that endpoint occurred at 1044, which is an hour and a half before guard duty said anything. Now this is condensed, right? I did all of this in about two hours. But you can see that Webb piped up and said, hey, someone's hitting this endpoint. Not that that's bad. I'm sure your DevOps people hit that endpoint all day. But security credentials, probably not. Wire data, so if anyone is familiar with Splunk, we have an app called Stream, which allows you to capture wire data. Same thing, web traffic, an hour and a half before 
guard duty said anything. Well, we already talked about get caller identity. Does anyone notice what's in yellow? Anything unique? Sorry, what? Three to five minutes or? It is, it is. That, I did that on purpose just to. It's every three minutes. Anyone know what that could be? Now I did that to prove a point, right? I wanted to do a keep alive while I was doing this to keep the session alive so that my session would stay alive. A lot of people do this, right? Beaconing, reaching out every two days or three days just to keep the session alive. I did three minutes to prove a point, but does anyone in the room actually know what the default timeout is for command line access to AWS? No one ever knows this. A a an hour? No. <clears throat> 12 hours. So I could have checked in some random number between zero and 12 hours, and you never would have seen it. Are you starting to, to see where some other stuff might help in your investigation? So once we did that, I kind of added in some enterprise security, some other tools. And these are some advice, this is some advice on, on my part, right? What, if you wanna look for something like this, how would you look for this? Set up rules that, that track that metadata endpoint. Um, there's no reason that you're hitting security credentials a lot. You may hit it once or twice a day in an application, but if you see that, if you see that endpoint hit 20 or 30 times an hour, something weird is going on. Alert on so when I created the Lambda function, I created it and deleted it within 30 seconds. Alert on that. DevOps guys will do that probably all day. They'll create a Lambda function and delete it, right? So you can kind of whitelist those, those types of things, but that shouldn't be happening from unknown users. We have cloud security dashboards in ES. If, you have any, if there are any ES customers, I'm gonna show you what that is, but um, We've, we've, added a lot of, we've added a lot of dashboards and searches to enterprise security based on this specific event that we created a couple years ago. And also, I know it's chatty, I know it's loud, but wire data, VPC flow logs, they really are helpful in, a, in, in the long run, right? If you can do it, it's worth it. So what did E, and, and again, like I said at the beginning, this is out of the box. I didn't do any configuration, no setup. ES found this on its own. It had this rule automatically enabled. So you can see that it says, I see a new login. I see a new login from a new city. I see a new login from a new country and a new region. And that's all very accurate and it created a notable event with a risk score of 126, which is not very high, but like I said, this is out of the box. It even had the name, and I'm sorry, I don't have a pointer, but if you look under risk object, it has the name of the user that I actually created. Dashboards, everybody loves pretty pictures. Same thing. You can see activity by user, very important, unknown slash root. You have Frothly, which is not a normal username. Uh, hopefully no one has, has that type of username. And then over under most recent IAM activity, you can actually start to see what I showed you in CloudTrail. So create user, create user, create user. 
if you scroll down, there's a couple of errors where I fat fingered a, a session token or something like that. That would probably notify you as well. But all of this is just out of the box. I didn't change anything, I didn't do anything. I just installed enterprise security. And that's kind of where it all comes together. So you have all of your AWS data on the left-hand side coming into uh, enterprise security. And then you have the ability to act on it, right? So what I just showed you was a manual investigation. If you implement something like SOAR, any SOAR, you could go out, reach out, disable that user account, delete all the EC2 instances that I created, turn on private access for that public bucket, bucket again. I'll want to automate it. So you wouldn't even have to do anything. Now, some people don't like that. I got into an argument with a CISO once about automation, saying he didn't want to have anything automated in his environment, and I was like, okay, you don't have to. Um, but that's kind of the flow of the entire event slash attack. Um, if you want to see this, you want to see the data that we created, we actually offer multiple workshops, bots, if you haven't played a boss of the sock. Um, and in fact, this specific event and data are part of one of our AWS workshops. So if you're a Splunk customer, reach out to your rep, ask for a workshop. I think, to sum it up, right, remember the AWS shared responsibility model? Wire data is important, it helps. When I did this originally, AWS didn't have WAF. Now they do. That probably would have stopped it, right? I didn't enable that because I wanted it to break, but that is also something. Please, please, please test your code. This, this was ultimately the, the, the thing that got this specific customer was they had a web vulnerability in their application. We can blame AWS, we can blame hackers, we can blame Splunk, we can blame whoever you want, but ultimately whoever wrote that code probably doesn't work for that customer anymore. And then be meticulous with your IAM strategy. This never would have happened if Lambda wasn't running as root, if the EC2 instance role wasn't an admin, those types of things, right? So just be careful what you set up and what you're doing. And then if you have any more questions, there's a link at the bottom. Hopefully you guys signed up for our party. If you came by the booth, there was, there's a party tonight. Hopefully I'll see you there. And uh, if you have questions, feel free to shout them out. Stay after if you have private questions. But that's it. Thank you.